Live streaming has started. Good morning, everyone in the United States, and good evening to our distinguished panelists from China and Japan. My name is Dr. Adityanji, and we are here to start our roundtable discussion, which is a monthly feature. Today is September 9th, second Saturday, 10 a.m. in United States. And it is around 11.30 p.m. in Japan and China. So those of you who can see my PowerPoint, this is the fire you saw. It's not visible, Aditanji. It's not visible? Yeah. Okay, I will reshare it. Let me see. I'm having some technical glitches. So let me correct those. So the topic for today's discussion is basically US-China decoupling and de-risking the geoeconomic implications. And we will be having three panelists, one from China, one from the United States, and one from Japan. I want to emphasize that our distinguished panelists are speaking in their individual capacity. They are not representing their respective countries. So hopefully we should be able to see my PowerPoint this time. Let me start again. Otherwise, we will try to do without the PowerPoint. Let me try to do without the PowerPoint. So out of our three distinguished panelists, first distinguished panelist is Professor David Song. David Sung is currently Associate Professor in Linguistics at Zunyi Medical University, teaching general introduction to China to international students, mainly from Asian countries and translation related courses to Chinese foreign language learners. His academic focus is on contrastive study of China and English, aiming to reveal similarities and dissimilarities between English and Chinese linguistics, culturally and psychologically, and to dislocate the mechanism causative of these linguistic phenomena. He has participated in some local political consultative conferences, etc., and he is highly published. Our next distinguished panelist is Dr. Satoru Nago. He is a non-resident fellow at Hudson Institute based in Tokyo, Japan. His primary research area are US, Japan, India security cooperation. He was awarded his PhD by Gukushuin University in 2011 for his thesis, India's military strategy, the first such research thesis on this topic in Japan. He holds numerous other research positions, including director at the International Security Industrial Council, senior research fellow at Japan Forum for Strategic Studies, he has been visiting scholar at Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. He has worked previously as a research fellow at the Tokyo Foundation and the Ocean Policy Research Foundation in Tokyo as a postdoc. He has authored numerous books and articles on security issues, and he also contributes a column, Age of Japan, 
India Alliance. And our final panelist is Mr. Dinesh Nilawar. Mr. Nilawar is a geopolitical commentator. He has a professional background in engineering, technology, and IT industries. He is a US citizen based in California. He has been following the global order for several decades. He has written several peer reviewed articles and books on geopolitics. He is also affiliated with a think tank called American Indo Pacific Forum, where he is the executive director. So we come to the topic. I will not take much time on the topic and expect my distinguished panelists to speak on that. Over talks on decoupling start during the Trump administration. With the change in administration, the Biden administration continued the policies towards China, suggesting a strong bipartisan support. It was, however, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of European Commission, who in March of 2023, prior to a China visit, coined the new word, de-risking instead of decoupling. And since then, Biden administration has adopted de-risking as the official policy instead of decoupling. The strategic concept of de-risking is explained by administration officials as a small yard high fence strategy. That involves French shoring, near shoring, and onshoring as the new mantra instead of offshoring. However, despite administration's push, the US private sector still has reservations about both decoupling and de risking. So we are here to discuss this topic now, and I'm going to invite our first panelist. Professor David Song from China to give his opening statement for five minutes. Professor Song, the platform is yours. Please unmute yourself before you start speaking. Please unmute yourself. You are muted. Yes. Now can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, Good evening and good morning, distinguished um, panelists from the United States, from Japan, and also from India. Uh, actually, I'm not an expert in politics, and I'm not a researcher in geopolitics or politics or po um, policies. I'm just a um, lover of languages, but as an ordinary Chinese person, I'd like to inch share with you my understanding of decoupling and de-risking between China and the, the United States. Well, if you look at a report by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, it is said that one cannot expect a return to engagement as the U.S. knew it. The company is likely to continue in one form or another, even if, even if it does evolve in a more measured, targeted way. We can infer that the U.S. decoupling with China economically or in a run way has been an established policy of the U.S. government, no matter which party holds presidency. The chamber also admits that during the past decades, U.S.-China economy has become deeply intertwined. It warns decoupling will disrupt the existing supply chains, exacerbate delays in production, and force companies and consumers to pay a big price. Actually, de-risking is nothing new, but another word for decoupling. According to Agassi, Demarus, it entails mitigating the vulnerabilities posed by deep economic ties between the United States and China. But vulnerabilities exist in both countries due to economic interconnections. An expert named Paul Gervitz holds that very likely different countries will interpret and apply de-risking differently, creating divergence and not consensus in some countries producing a modest scope of economic separation. In some potentially a policy similar to decoupling. So can understand it this way, 
it's not an easy or rather an impossible job to disentangle one side from the other economically in the current global situation where all countries, especially big economies, are increasingly independent in all respects. In 2018, the then American President Donald Trump, supposedly annoyed by the trade deficit, staged a trade war against China. In effort to suppress Chinese companies, restrict China's high tech technology, and stifle China's economic growth. In 2020, while the election, with the election approaching, he raised the idea again of separating U.S. and Chinese economies, probably in hope of getting more votes. After taking over from Donald Trump, Joe Biden has been continuing his predecessor's hard line toward China to throttle China's economic growth, putting many Chinese companies on its entity list with reasons that do not hold water. They believe that the United States must decouple from China by reducing U.S. dependence on Chinese products and the supply chains for both economic and national security reasons. The U.S. sees China as a strategic rival competing for influence on a global stage. Some American policymakers believe that economic decoupling could be a way to counter China's growing influence and protect U.S. interests. They argue that reducing economic interdependence would provide leverage for U.S. in addressing various issues. Actually, I don't think that China is a rival for the United States. I mean, it is not a military rival. We are just rivals in terms of economy that should be developed in a very healthy manner. If we go back to take out the volumes, the trade volumes between China and the US, we can say that during the past two years, the trade volumes between China and the US has been on the increase. So it's really hard to realize Donald Trump dream of decoupling the U.S. from China economically or in other ways. From the trade volumes over the past two years, we can say that the U.S.-China trade volumes have been on the increase for three consecutive years, despite some American politicians trying to estrange China economically and technolog technologically. This is an indisputable proof that China and the U.S., just like China and other countries, or U.S. and other countries, are economically inseparable. On the contrary, the latest trade figures make it clear that the two countries remain highly reliant on one another for both exports and imports. So in my view, China and the U.S. should not only avoid decoupling, but also continue to further cooperate for the benefits of the people of both countries. Well, if China and the U.S. really decouple, there would be significant and serious consequences. U.S.-China decoupling, if it really happens in an irresistible way, will bring about unbearable consequences to the peoples of both sides and even to the world. When it comes to economic, impacts decoupling from China could lead to a significant reduction in global trade. Both the U.S. and China are central to the world supply chains, and the decoupling could dis disrupt these systems, leading to increased cost and decreased efficiency. If American companies are forced to save ties with Chinese manufacturers, the cost of goods could rise significantly. China's manufacturing sector is critical to keeping prices low for many products for the United States, not just for the United States, for all the world. Both the U.S. and China could say decreased economic growth as a result of decoupling. So it will not only impact China, but it also impact the United States itself. So the relationship between the two countries has been integral 
to their economic success over the past few decades. Well, if we go to the technological impacts, the US is the leader in technological research and innovation. But China also takes the lead in some certain areas. A decoupling could lead to a slowdown in technological progress if collaboration between the two countries is reduced. Decoupling could result in the fragmentation of technology access terms with separate standards, regulations, and supply chains emerging in the US and China. This could hinder global innovation and collaboration, as well as impede the development and deemployment of emerging industries. And we know that decoupling could exacerbate geopolitical tensions between the United States and China. It may contribute to an escalation of strategic competition, heightening the risk of conflicts or disputes in areas such as the South China Sea or Taiwan Strait. Other countries may be forced to choose sides in the decoupling. This will change the balance of global alliances and potentially create new geopolitical divisions and a more polarized international system. All the people in this world don't like to say this happen because if the whole world falls into conflicts again, who will suffer are just people like me, ordinary citizens, ordinary people. The people in high positions, the people working for the government, the high rank officials will still enjoy their own benefits. So I suggest that all the issues, all the questions can be handled if the two countries, if all countries sit together and they began to negotiate over the disputes and the disagreements. So I think that China and the United States should take the following steps to strengthen further cooperation, not decoupling. For example, they can strengthen their diplomatic engagement and they can talk to each other about how to go by the rules, not should be um, abided by by all the countries. Maybe there are some problems uh, when different countries cooperate, when different countries interact. Maybe there are some problems that are not so acceptable in other countries. But we can address these problems through negotiation. And we also know that this world should develop forward, not step back. Decoupling will do nothing but bring about more conflicts economically and maybe militarily if the disputes between different countries cannot be addressed. For example, if, the, if decoupling happens between China and the US, and this will also happen between the United States and other countries, and the other countries with other countries, this is really a disaster for all the human beings. So my conclusion is that all the countries, including China, and the United States, Japan, India, and other countries, we, all the governments should sit together for the benefits of their peoples to talk to each other over the problems. Thank you. You are on mute, I think, Dr. Arthur Kunji. Thank you, Professor Sun. We understand that you are speaking as a private citizen and not as a representative of government of China. Uh, and you made your point amply well. Now it is my honor to invite Mr. Dinesh Nilawar, who will be speaking 
about a possible US point of view, again, as a private citizen. So I'm going to hand over the platform to Mr. Nilal. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Adityanji. So my name is Dinesh Nilawar. Um, I have a, um, a background in the uh, geopolitics, um, mainly as uh, an author and a uh, couple of articles have written on this for a long time observation of uh, geopolitics. And the next uh, version is called geoeconomics. That's the topic really uh, at today's topic is, which is basically geography and economics and how major economies work and which impacts the rest of the world. So now, what is decoupling? So decoupling has a specific um, uh, uh, focus here. So the decoupling, which is uh, from a US point of view, is to uh, not remove, but not rely on one one country or one supplier or one uh, area of uh, supp supplies for for the economy, uh, which is between USA and China. It has grown up to up to seven hundred billion uh, dollars in goods uh, and uh, products and also services. So. Uh, if you look at from a US point of view, when they talk about decoupling, it's mainly it's a China plus one kind of strategy. So they're not really removing everything, but they are de-risking. Actually, the new word is called de-risking. So that is a main strategy, but let us focus on exactly how it started. With the COVID, USA suddenly found there is a shortage of uh, uh, PPP kits and uh, supplies for taking care of the COVID patients. Suddenly, they figured out that most of the supplies are only coming from China, and there are restrictions from China coming and importing to USA. So that suddenly, they figured out that we need to de-risk and come up with suppliers who are away from China so that uh, they don't depend on only on one country. That's how it started. It's not um, about, uh, Trump administration policies or any other policies from a political point of view. So it was uh, purely a disaster during the COVID uh, situation, which forced the country and the economic situations and the suppliers that they need to figure out a way to get more supplies from different countries. And then the policies kicked in and then the administration took uh, notice of different uh, products and uh, um, goods which are being imported and figure out that there should be a, a more de-risking of these imports. So that's a very simple explanation we are trying to give here. The other point here is uh, after the Trump administration started focusing on these things and then it continued with the uh, Joe Biden administration, they started looking at um, restrictions on trade on high technology and semiconductor, which is really the focus right now, because these technologies go in for dual use uh, for military technology also. So USA from a strategic point of view has a focus on uh, removing any risk of uh, technology going into the defense sector uh, without authorization, which already they have uh, these controls for many countries for a long uh, many decades. But with the US-China trade going uh, very high, they wanted to make sure that uh, these are controlled, these products and these technologies are controlled. But if you look at restricted tariffs for products where the, uh, uh, they wanted to de-risk and decouple, those have come down by 10% from a percentage point of view, but those, products which are not part of the restriction, they have increased by 40%. So there's really no really decoupling. It's the product mixture, product uh, uh, mix, which has changed between US and India, which is what they want, they want to control. So now there are many other factors which are happening around the world. There is deglobalization, which is part of the Western economies also trying to uh, move away from the earlier globalization, which uh, was going on for last 40 years or so, 
as part of the world trade organizations second is there is the dollar use of dollar in the trading system there is a financial reset so many things are happening which is contributing to something called as de-risking which also uh, will impact in the uh, decoupling of economies so since usa and china are the one of the uh, biggest economies in the world so there's going to be an impact no matter what okay so that is the reality but it's not going to impact in a way that completely the imports will be removed and then uh, america will not stop importing so that's not going to happen but one more other strategy which america is following is uh, near shoring or french shoring where most of the products are going to be only from China, from Canada and Mexico. So Mexico is going to be the new center of production. And then Canada has uh, resources and uh, many other advantages. So they are planning on near shoring on supplying uh, goods. And already these two countries are the largest trading uh, countries with the USA. So they are going to uh, go into products and increase the mix of products which they are going to uh, import from Mexico and Canada. So that is the big strategy around uh, the uh, decoupling of uh, US economy from the external world. So that is part of it is actually driving the deglobalization. So deglobalization is reduction in the globalization of the trade and goods and services, which has peaked in the last 40 years into more sustainable and uh, more, uh, you know, geographically uh, uh, region-wise uh, 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 service goods and uh, trading of the goods and services. Instead of uh, moving the goods away from uh, across the world from one point to another, goods are actually going to be made, products are going to be made near the uh, where the demand is. So that way, the environment and the cost of production and transportation also will be reduced. Those are the big strategies which um, the economists are working on. Policies are being made for for those uh, kind of situations. But companies also have a strategy. What's going on? And they have to figure out how to um, um, risk, remove the risk of their operations make sure the revenue growth is still there, plus remove any kind of disruptions which they face during the COVID times. So COVID time is a good example of how disruption happens and the companies have to figure out how to de-risk their operations. <clears throat> so specifically uh, with respect to China, companies can be categorized into three or four categories. One is the upstream market where they make most of the production like um, You've got uh, Nike, a lot of big companies where big production is done in uh, China and they're exported to the rest of the world. 60% uh, of the world export is done through China. So those are upmarket uh, players. So there they have to have a strategy where China plus one, where they need to move to other countries. Examples are like uh, uh, we have Vietnam and uh, Southeast Asian nations and then India. So India is still in an early stage right now. So partly some of the companies have moved to India, but uh, it's not going to be in the same scale as in China. So the other part is the other companies which are mostly dual players. So they not only have production in China, but uh, China is also a big market for them. So that means consumption of the product in China is very big. That means their revenue Sales of revenue from China is big. So that for them, what they do is um, they have to have a contingency, but they will continue to push the product inside China and they will have the production in China plus in other countries. You know, some companies had uh, com uh, companies in the Filipino, Philippines and uh, other uh, Southeast Asian countries. They increase the production in those countries so that any disruption from China can also be tackled in this way. So that is the second uh, side of the second uh, set of companies. The third set of companies are basically um, downstream, which are low risk, small companies, don't have much sales in China, hardly 3%, 2%.
so they are really not in the radar so they can easily afford to go outside china and then make a production in other countries so they are really small but majority of the companies are in that stage right now from american point of view only the big brands have the big production in uh, china and then china exports a lot of different products to uh, you know uh, different uh, uh, products to uh, retail shops and other places so those uh, are manufactured mostly in china so they also have to figure out what to do if there is a disruption in terms of uh, sales so from a china point of view this decoupling is mostly in a different way they have a make in india china policy which they announced in 2015 to make sure that uh, uh, china has uh, access to technology access to capabilities and then uh, focus on products and technology which they don't have and then focus on mergers and acquisition which they can bring in products and technologies which china wants so that making in the making china policy is a very big policy but there have been restrictions because their investment have been going into strategic areas like semiconductor and technologies and restrictions were put by us administration so that this um, investment also came down so that way there are a lot of uh, areas where the focus is mostly on the way uh, the trade happens and then how to make sure that no matter whatever happens the companies have a way or figure out a way to make sure there is de-risking of the uh, products which are coming from China so that they have alternate suppliers. Can now, you please what, conclude? Yeah. So overall, that is a good summary we have given on the uh, US-China uh, decoupling uh, situation. So uh, the final conclusion, we can say that really at this point, the seriousness of the decoupling is starting now, which whatever has happened in the last four years is just the beginning. but now the real changes is starting it will start because of the changes in the world uh, trading system and the global financial system so we're going to see more action coming in so we'll have to keep a watch on all this stuff thank you very much thank you mr nilagar for presenting again as a private citizen but u.s perspective now we have our third distinguished panelist who is neither from china nor from u.s he is from japan and he'll give in, uh, giving his own perspective, sitting from a third country about US-China decoupling and de-risking. So my pleasure to invite Dr. Satoru Nagao. Dr. Nagao, the floor is yours, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Indeed, sir, I'm the security guy or military guy, so that's why it's a completely different uh, I will talk about it. But uh, view from the military situation, China's provocation against the country around China or against the U.S. interest has already crossed the red line. So that's why the, the U.S.-China Cold War has already started. So topics uh, should be which side will win. That is the reason I'm focusing on this. So now the de-risking, the cap decoupling the, these ones the issue of the economy uh, so why the uh, us focusing on or china focusing on this competition uh, when we check the, uh, china's national power because money is in a uh, money is the source of the china's uh, uh, current power and the current assertiveness indeed so that's why decoupling or de-risking is the right way to deal with china for example, when we talk about uh, uh, rapid military modernization of the Chinese uh, armed forces, without money, without ample budget, they cannot do that. When we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, the infrastructure project, uh, which uh, creates uh, infrastructure in the third country, but uh, because of the high interest rates, this project creates a huge debt and China can control these countries uh, because of the, this debt. But without enough money, they cannot do that. That's why money is a source of power. 
and we need to focus in on. When the Trump administration sworn in and the President Trump said, make business out of China. That's why people say decoupling. But decoupling is uh, maybe media words. Uh, no, no, official document we cannot find so many times. Uh, yeah, I think I haven't found, I think. But the risking is now official word. And the risking could, could lead to the decoupling. So that's why the, now the, this is real policy. And uh, if the U.S. continues the policy of the de-risking, it will lead to the decoupling in the future, in the long run. So, but uh, why? It's uh, because the source of uh, power of the China is money. And uh, so when we check the uh, American uh, foreign policy, and when we check uh, this policy toward China, uh, indeed, uh, I strongly believe that America in the law on the law to win the competition with China. There are three reasons. Firstly, the problem of China is caused in part the image of China is rising and the US is de declining. But uh, when we check the uh, real power of the United States, US is still stronger than China. For example, the military expenditure. U.S. is uh, far higher than China, more than double. Of course, uh, uh, recently, the, some analysis pointed out uh, U.S. military expenditure is nearly the same when we check uh, how much uh, weapons they can buy or the, something like that, because uh, China can buy the weapon more cheaper, uh, cheaper prices. So that's why the, uh, some analysis say the equal uh, military expenditure U.S. and China is spending. But uh, most case, most analysis say U.S. military expenditure is higher than China. And secondly, United States has more allies. U.S. has 53 formal allies, including NATO, Japan, South Korea. In this case, uh, even if uh, we cannot include India, which is a partner but not a formal treaty-based ally, number is 53. But China. Only North Korea is 3D based array. So in this case, 53 versus one. But this number is very important when we check the last three competition. World War One, winning side is 32 countries and loser side only four. In the World War Two, 54 versus eight, including Japan. And the uh, US Soviet Cold War, winning side has 54 and the loser side is 26. So this means that number is important matter. 53 versus one is matter. And the uh, recent action by the United States indicate that US has a long-term plan to win the competition. Because, uh, because of the experience of Japan, I strongly believe that. For example, the uh, Republican or Democrat, the, uh, indeed they share the same uh, China policy. When we check the high-tech war Trump administration advertised, indeed, when the high-tech war had started, when, uh, we can find one report published by the Barack Obama's administration, which is uh, Democrats. So uh, the name is uh, uh, a little long, that this report name is, uh, but uh, ZTE and Huawei's products they're focusing on in this report. And that was published in 2012. And uh, because of Japanese, I strongly believe that because uh, U.S. history, the 247 years uh, history now, uh, if I make mistakes, uh, uh, could you forgive me? One or two years difference. Uh, but uh, anyway, 200, about 250 years ago, U.S. was just one of the colony of the British Empire. But uh, they have transformed. Uh, to the world's only superpower last 250 years. And during this process, all of the rivals of the United, ha United States, including Germany, Japan, and Soviet Union, disappeared. If so, when the President Biden starts to say China is most serious competitor, this is serious competition. Because uh, one shall stand and one shall fall. And before the World War One, I mean, sorry, World War Two. Indeed, there are uh, many plans. Japanese know that. Orange plan was planned by the United States. Uh, 
orange plan was uh, how to fight against Japan and implemented it. But the uh, interesting part is not this uh, orange. Indeed, uh, there are many colored plan, including red plan, which defeat the uh, British in the World War II. You can imagine uh, United you can imagine uh, United States has a plan to defeat British uh, between the World War I and World War II. Because in the both war, US support British. But uh, indeed, the US has a plan to defeat the British. So any contingency the United States is preparing because international relations is moving always. If so, when the President Biden starts to say China is the most serious competitor, is there the plan? I think so. So US is still stronger than China. US has more allies, including Japan in this case. And the US has a plan to win the competition. So I strongly believe that America is on the road to win the competition with China. That is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Nagao. And I think you proved your point by your very lucid talk that geopolitics and geoeconomics are inseparable. And actually, geoeconomics, you know, govern the geopolitics. So everything is centered around geoeconomics, and it's the economic interests that drive the geopolitical interests. And being a, a person from strategic background, you amply, you know, prove your point. Now we'll go to our next. Uh, phase of moderated discussion, and I'll be asking questions to all the three panelists. Just one word of caution. We are having some problems with our WebEx connection today. In case we prematurely disconnect, we will send another link for everyone to rejoin. But if it does not happen, we'll be fine. We'll continue. So my first question is to Professor David Soon. Professor Sung, you rightly said that it is important for US and China to sit together and sit together with other countries to talk things out and negotiate rather than come to some sort of confrontation. Having said that, President Xi lost an important opportunity for negotiations on global stage as we are talking today as he missed failed to attend the G20 summit in New Delhi, India, where President Biden and other heads of states from G20 countries are meeting. What was China's reason for President Xi to miss that international important global platform where economic and developmental issues are decided? You have to unmute yourself before you answer. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. I think this is decision by the by the, by the top Chinese, you know, leadership. Uh, Mr. Xi just came back from the um, the summit of of BRICS held in South Africa, and uh, after he came back to China, he inspected a lot of regions that has. That have been stricken by storms to say if their life and the transportation have been recovered in those places. And the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Ch of China says that the Premier of China actually now is visiting, is participating in the summit in India on behalf of President Xi Jinping. Well, what I can say is that I, I don't actually, I don't know why Mr. Xi is not present in there, but I can guess that, you know, China is a really big country, he has so many business to do when he was back in China. And, you know, the economy in China is not so good now. We have to do something to improve our economy. 
as an ordinary person, <laughs> I'm sorry. I actually I can just give you an answer. That is my own understanding. Thank you, Professor Sung. You, I understand your situation. You cannot speak for government of China, but the point I'm making is that President Xi, for whatever reason, lost an important opportunity because downgrading the representation to premier level does not give that gravitas to negotiating strength of China. Yeah, I understand. I understand your point, but I don't think this. I don't think Mr. Xi has lost his opportunity because Premier Yi Chang can also represent the Chinese government to talk to the leaders of other countries, including your own government in India, right? It may not be on the side bilaterals that usually head of states uh, uh, sort of involve. Anyway, I'll go to my next question to the next panelist. And the next panelist I'm asking question is Mr. Dinesh Nilawar. Mr. Nilawar, what would be the US strategic and geoeconomic posture? in case China crossed two uh, red lines. And I think Dr. Nagoa has already talked about crossing red lines. One red line is invasion of Taiwan. And second red line is possible Chinese invasion of Senakaku Islands. Okay. So what is the question on these uh, two red lines? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. What is the question on these two red lines? What would be the US strategic and geoeconomic posture in case China crosses these red lines? Yes, yes. So uh, let's look at the past behavior, past uh, American um, strategy. So whenever there was some confrontation or the tensions have increased in the Taiwan Straits or in the the Cocoa Islands uh, with Japan. Uh, what has USA done? USA has only shown military um, response, okay, by bringing in their uh, fleet into the South China Sea or to the East Asia, and uh, and some uh, talks or discussion or some kind of uh, pressure. From in the multilateral forums, but if you look at the American response, it has not been uh, much on the economic front. Okay, they have never imposed tariffs or sanctions on Chinese eco products because of some tension in Asia. Okay, so this is a strategy. So they just want to uh, have a deterrence against China's uh, confrontation or any kind of uh, uh, tension in the surrounding areas, including Taiwan and uh, Japan, the Cocoa Islands, they want a deterrence, but do not want a um, disruption in the economic trade, okay? That is the, that is the way they have handled till now in the last one or two decades after China has come into World Trade Organization. But moving forward, these red lines are going to be more focused and more uh, dangerous, okay, especially for Taiwan and also for Japan. So China has increased its uh, military in the last 20 years, its uh, strategy and its uh, global uh, presence has increased. So. Uh, any of its confrontation will be much more dangerous and deadly. So America has to change its policy from not just deterrence, it has to probably go active in terms of, um, as uh, Dr. Sattel said that it's about the money. So if they start putting sanctions on Chinese uh, products to deter China from taking any military actions, on Taiwan or on Sankofa Islands, that will be a new policy which will be discussed and which will come out very forcefully out of Washington DC, but we will be hearing that. So that will be a big change. Uh, okay, it might come in various forms. It could be only strategic, it could be on certain sections, like how um, Russia was uh, fully sanctioned and including the Russian assets were, uh, uh, were uh, taken out from Russian hands. 
which is a very big change uh, in terms of uh, global policy in the recent times. Chinese strategy will may be different. They might, because China, trade with China is very big, they might do in strategic uh, areas only. So we don't know yet. There is a lot of, uh, um, I would say, uh, oppos meaning uh, options there, but they might try to do that way. Uh, you know, just uh, stopping some of the shipping itself will be a big deterrence against China. So there are many things which are going on. Uh, they have options, but the tension is going to be much bigger and uh, it it might be, red lines might be crossed more times in, in the next coming uh, years. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Nilawar. My next question goes to Dr. Satoru Nagao. Excuse me, sir. Can I jump in the, this discussion, sir? Uh, before uh, before uh, we enter the next uh, uh, topic, uh, can I uh, jump in, sir? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, because uh, I, I should explain the why I said the red line. Uh, and so my definition, I should explain. Because uh, this is a competition, U.S. must win. If so, if so, before it will be too late, the U.S. must move. That is a red line. So if uh, China continues to develop and the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, just look at uh, this development, in this case, the situation will come, it will be too late. So before such kind of situation will come, U.S. must move. So that's why the, I pointed out the red line. So red line is not the geographical area. Red line is a uh, uh, red line to uh, decide win or not, win or lose. That is a red line. So, view from the competition, which line is a, a red line, is a my definition. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Nagao, uh, the next question goes to you, and it is Japan specific question. China started blocking export of rare earth elements to Japan in 2010 and 2011. At that time, China had a monopoly of 93% of world's rare earth minerals and more than 99% of world's supply of most prized rare earths. What steps Japan has taken since 2011 to de-risk its rare earth supplies from China and other measures related to that blocking action of China? Uh, yes, that is a very serious and important question. Uh, to uh, develop uh, high-tech products, rare earth is very important. And because of the China's attitude, Japan realized uh, this uh, the seriousness uh, faster than other country, and we start to move. But uh, when so pr during the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, he tried to uh, persuade uh, many countries, developed country in this case. Uh, uh, why do we focus on this? Because the China's attitude towards Japan has changed uh, earlier than the China's attitude to change towards other countries. So, but at the same time, it is very difficult because China has already dominated the market of the rare earth. For example, the one German company that tried to uh, uh, try to develop the new mines of the rare earth. But in this case, because of the domination, China increased the production and the uh, uh, reduced uh, price. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, when the company checked the prices, this is too cheap. That's why they uh, gave up, gave up uh, to develop new mines. So domination can control such kind of situation. And China has already achieved it. Uh, some, uh, some rare, in some areas, 90% of the market are dominated by China. So that's why without the government strong support, it is impossible to uh, develop the new mines. So Jap that time, to, to the last decade, Japan has developed some mines, that's true, uh, in other country, including other, uh, mines in the other country. My, um, they asked, uh, it is uh, difficult to get in Japan, that's true. So that's why uh, with Australia, with the European countries, with India, the, we are already searching the, where is the mine, and in some cases, we have already invested, in, especially in Southeast Asia, too. So, but uh, the pace is very slow, that's true, because uh, without enough investment, we cannot do that. Um, currently, uh, other countries start to realize and cooperate with Japan to develop the new mines. 
and the uh, Kuaz uh, also focusing on uh, the critical technology or supply lines. So now uh, Japan is not alone. Japan can cooperate with other countries to develop new mines. So maybe uh, this plan uh, will, the uh, speed of the, this plan will up, I think. So, but uh, 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 just the starting point uh, we are located, I think. Thanks, Dr. Nagao. My next question goes to Professor Sung. Despite concerns expressed by China, the actual reason for decoupling and de-risking is aggressive and strategic postures undertaken by the People's Republic of China. Will Chinese government unilaterally declare, you know, not having any intentions of invading Taiwan by 2027 as is generally expected in order to prevent other countries from taking counter economic measures? Professor Sung. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, first, you have to say that the word invasion or invade might be might not be a correct word. You know that over uh, in the past, uh, before 1949, actually, you know, the Chinese government was led by Chiang Kai-shek, the then president of the People's Re of Republic of China. Taiwan now is still called the Republic of China. Actually, its territory also includes the territory of mainland China. Taiwan also claims that there is only one China, and its name is also Republic of China. Actually, this is a result of civil war between Kuomintang and the Communist Party of China, just like the conflict between brothers in the same family. For another example, there are also conflicts between different parts um, in some certain countries, like in Africa and even in some Asian countries, for example, in Myanmar. But we cannot call Myanmar um, is not an independent country, right? And we know that there are some forces in Myanmar that do not listen to the central government. But internationally, we all recognize that those forces, the territory of those forces are part of Myanmar. We do not recognize the independence of those territories occupied by some nationalist um, forces. I assume you have made your Myanmar. go to the substance of the question. If China uses force against Taiwan, yeah, yeah, I'm going. To, yeah, I'm going to answer your question. I have to, but I have to make it clear that uh, I don't China think that there would be a war between China and uh, between inner China and uh, Taiwan. I should say like this: I don't think there is a war between across the Taiwan Strait. We don't like to go to war with our own brothers and sisters. Okay, I'm a, right. I'm a clear. Well, you have made your point, uh, uh, but you need to be aware. The government of China needs to be aware that there will be response from other countries. My next question goes to Mr. Dinesh Nilawar, and the question is that the money is appropriated about fifty-two billion dollars for the Chips Act for onshoring of chips industry. Can some of this appropriation be used for French shoring in countries like India and Vietnam to provide alternatives for, uh, you know, advanced chip production? Yeah, okay. So, I let me be frank. Uh, I don't know the details about uh, this um, the CHIPS Act, but uh, it's mainly for the USA production uh, of the semiconductor chipsets, um, and then and making sure the new uh, investment goes to the new technologies which are still evolving, right? So 
a lot of new techniques were being done in um, Korea and Taiwan uh, and abroad in the last uh, four or five years. So now they want those innovations uh, to happen inside USA, and it can only happen if the reinvestment in USA inside USA. So uh, you hear about a lot of investment coming from even from the foreign companies into USA uh, in this uh, area. Now the chief fact is to uh, help these companies to come and relocate to uh, mainland America and then start the production and in, uh, invest in the new technologies. Now, if, uh, if we want to consider other countries, first other countries need to have an MOU or a, a agreement, deep agreement with American um, um, uh, trade um, policies and uh, a lot of investment policies before these kind of investment can go to those countries, like for India. India is in the early stage of negotiation with the USA. So we, it is uh, uh, in this stage, uh, uh, the MO is being signed and then India has got some good proposals from companies and uh, uh, companies are coming to India. So, but it is a long way before things can happen. So uh, this uh, CHIPS Act investment uh, amount of money at this point is probably too early to say maybe some amount will go because some of these company companies are going to have the same access to that and they might use it uh, in different ways but uh, definitely it will be useful but overall from a policy point of view um, i'm not sure this can be used directly for large investment but usa will have to sustain its investment and keep a lead on semiconductor technology. I talked to a few vice presidents of the companies from Japan in the recent semiconductor conference, and I talked to them and they said, yes, uh, now we have to work with the American policies so that we align with them. And he said, we were uh, dealing with China and uh, technologies were being sent to China. Now we cannot directly send it as in the past because now we have to align with American uh, policies and then we have to take permission from America before we can send the new technology to China. So there are a lot of this, this, uh, restrictions have kicked in with the Japanese companies. So they know that and they are moving to America. Uh, South Korea companies are also moving to America and Taiwanese companies are also moving to America. So there are a lot of these changes we see in the semiconductor industry. So this is still yet to, uh, you know, the, it's still going on at this point, at this uh, uh, moment. So we will see more actions coming in the future also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nilava. My next question is for Dr. Nagao. Dr. Nagao, you are a military man and you have talked about, you know, crossing the red lines and be prepared for those as soon as possible rather than wait for things to happen. As we speak, Japan has a cumulative investment of $130 billion in China. When will Japan ever consider starting a process of decoupling and de-risking from China for Japan? Any answers? Kindly unmute yourself. You are muted. Yes, sir. I can I confidence to say that Japan's decoupling policy has already started because faster than the other country. Because when we check the number of the Japanese stay in China, it has decreased 28% since 2012. So this is big number. So nearly one third of the Japanese has already left China. Why? B business is there. Business is growing in China because Japan has already invested huge. So that's why now Japan, Japanese business uh, owners want to get more benefit from China. But at the same time, they try to withdraw their workers from China. That's why 28% Japanese has already left China. So Japan is preparing the uh, crisis. Japan is preparing the decoupling. Firstly, we try to leave from China. That has already started. But uh, uh, in the business, I'm not a business expert, I'm a military guy, but uh, generally the people say 
uh, after invest seven years, they start to get uh, income, benefit. So that's why uh, Japan invest more than seven years. This means that now is the best time to get benefit. Benefit is there. Business guy cannot ignore this. That is the current situation. So they want to, they try to withdraw. They are preparing, but process is very slow because b huge benefit they are receiving. Japanese government try to persuade them, or security guys like me try to persuade them, and they start to understand. Recent, uh, 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 recent water released from uh, new, uh, nuclear plant of Fukushima is one of the example. Uh, China's fake news criticize Japan again and again, and other countries admit, even IAE admit, uh, this water is safer than uh, uh, water came from Chinese nuclear plant because the contaminant level is one tenth of the uh, water came from Chinese nuclear plant. Still, China says this is dangerous. Japan is dangerous. China's one is not dangerous. So, China do not need a reason to criticize Japan. Japanese business owners start to understand this China's attitude. So they want to live, but they want to get benefit. So balanced they are uh, trying. That's the current situation. But the company has already started. We can say so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. My final round of questions will start with Professor David Sung. Professor Sung, kindly unmute yourself. Uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative has resulted in actually de facto debt diplomacy and high indebtedness for majority of the global South countries. In the event of a US-China conflict, most of these indebted countries may be having their, you know, good feelings towards the United States. Dr. Nagao already told that United States has 53 allies, China has only one, North Korea. And that's the reality of international relations and geopolitics. Will China ever considered 100% debt forgiveness to those countries that have been and mesh in the Belt and Road Initiative without any preconditions like mortgaging, leasing their ports and infrastructure to China. Will China consider 100% debt forgiveness? Professor Sung, kindly unmute yourself. You are unmute. Uh, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, thank you for question. Yeah, uh, Doctor Nagal said that China has only one ally, and the United States has fifty allies. Well, I think this is an ideology of a Cold War. Why? I don't understand why you guys always call that. Oh, we have so many brothers. We have so many allies. So that we can, uh, we can abuse your country, whatever I like. This is not. Um, I don't think this is appropriate for more than human beings. Actually, the whole world should be brothers and sisters, not just one country and one country united together against a third one, such as China. Right. If we take Japan, for example, Japan used to be the enemy of of the United States. Now they are allies. So things always change. Well, just now you said that well, China um, has forgiven a lot of loans in African countries, right? Did you mention this? Will China consider a hundred percent loan forgiveness? <laughs> One hundred percent. Um, I have to say that this uh, is decided by the Central Chinese government. I do not have any, have any right to comment this, but I know that if China is, uh, or China has the ability to help other countries, China will lend out a helping hand to other countries. For example, you know, most countries in African countries are really 
in need of help. Just like Japan, Japan also helped China quite a lot over the past 40 years. We are still grateful for the Japanese people and the Japanese government. I don't think I don't think that different countries should conflict. This is not a good way. And Nagao also said that oh, the ambition of Chinese nuclear plant is so high, and China's is not dangerous, while the Japan's is dangerous. I'm afraid that there is a misunderstanding between the Japanese people and the um, uh, Chinese people. Actually, right now, you know, um, Chinese, I think the Chinese government has already left the ban of the seafood from Japan. Even good brothers sometimes also argue with each other, let alone two big countries. You know, they also want to defend their own interests. We should not stand, you know, like enemies. We should stand as friends always. And this is a good way for all human beings. Otherwise, the whole world will fall into pieces because of conflicts and wars. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sun. You sidestepped the question that was being asked. Before I go to my next question to Mr. Nilawar, I'm going to use my moderator's position to make an editorial comment. You rightly said that, you know, all the humanity should be one, all the countries should be brothers. Uh, unfortunately, China's rhetoric does not match with China's actions. In the current G20 summit, the motto that Indian government gave was Vasudhai Kutumbukam, the world is one family, and China opposed it tooth and nail. Uh, so the rhetoric of China about international good relations, brotherliness, harmony, does not match with the actual actions when you oppose for G20, the motto Vasudhai Kutumbukam, which means world is one family. Now I'm going to go to my next question, that is to Mr. Nilawar. Mr. Nilawar, in response to de-risking strategies, China has started to retaliate against United States. China has introduced export controls on gallium and germanium, two rare elements used in semiconductor manufacturing, just like it had retaliated against Japan in 2011. What is the U.S. response going to be to this Chinese hostile measure? Yeah, so, um, so this is not new. Um, so China, China considers decoupling as trade control, okay? It's actually trade control for Chinese government. So what is trade control for Chinese government? Chinese government trade control is restricting the export of products uh, based on strategic interest, uh, making sure uh, products are made in China, which uh, has, uh, which China does not have the capabilities right now. Okay, and then, um, and then. Uh, increase mergers and acquisition of uh, companies. They invested a lot in the United States to acquire companies. So there has been uh, billions of dollars which has come in 30, 40 billion dollars. But after the actions by the US government, it has come down. Okay. So from a China point of view, from a strategic point of view, if America has restricted the semiconductor industry, then China says that it has to retaliate on certain materials and raw materials such as these rare earth materials which are used in semiconductor industry. So United States then had an agreement with Japan to get these uh, rare earth materials and with other countries including India and a lot of other countries which have the same uh, uh, rare earth minerals. So USA has taken uh, measures to uh, make sure that the suppliers of these uh, rare earth materials have uh, been decoupled and de-risked, and they have multiple suppliers. 
Uh, similarly, it happened in lithium technology also. Suddenly, you see lithium deposits are being discovered all over the world. Something like that is going to happen with the, these uh, rare materials for the semiconductor industry. Uh, so there is a de-risking de going on. So the USA will pursue that. But from a China point of view, it says that its control of the trade includes these kind of restrictions. It's not only raw materials like this, rare earth materials. They even talk about restricting the exports of finished goods if they want to. So they have these practices going on for a long time. It's not something new. They have restricted some shipments and uh, certain materials, uh, including during the COVID time. So there has been such cases. So uh, US government has taken measures for a lot of these things. So it's not something which uh, uh, is going to be let go like that because US supplies, US suppliers and US supply chain has to be stopped and they need to figure out uh, different ways to make sure that there is no uh, disruption in terms of supplies and stocks and uh, raw materials. So this is an ongoing process. I think semiconductor industry is a top focus for the US uh, government. So they're going to make sure that uh, all these things are uh, taken care of so that the supply chain for all the supplies uh, have a de-risked uh, uh, policy so that they don't depend on few countries uh, in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Milagar. I am going to ask my final question to Dr. Nagao, and after that, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Dr. Nagao, you are a military man, and you think in terms of strategic issues. In case of China's possible invasion of Senkaku Islands, will Japan consider total disinvestment and total discoupling from Chinese economy? Okay, so of course, uh, Japan is preparing such kind of situation, but at the same time, so when we, uh, we check what happened uh, against the current Russia. Indeed, there is no total decoupling because there are plenty of the neutral countries and indirectly we can trade. So that's why the total decoupling will not happen in any case in, under the current world, I think. The indirect trade will continue. So that's why the uh, but uh, anyway, uh, decoupling will happen if the war has started. And uh, if uh, China to, uh, takes the Senkaku Island, we will take back. That is the preparation uh, we have done. We cannot rely on the US uh, totally in this case, we believe, because the Senkaku Island is too small for the United States to take back. United States will join the war means that U.S. citizens need to sacrifice their lives for Japan. It is uh, illogical. So that's why if China takes Senkaku Island, Japan must take back ourselves and the U.S. will support Japan. That is logical. So that's why we are preparing to take back Senkaku Island if China take. And in this case, if the uh, uh, economical uh, trade between uh, two countries will disrupt uh, temporarily, uh, we, Japan must accept it because this is war. And the indirect will, uh, trade will continue, uh, I think. And that is uh, my, uh, my answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. I'm going to start taking questions from the audience. And there's a question from Mr. Bhagwat. The question is the econo ongoing economic posturing is direct result of the Cold War originating in ideological divide between the two countries, that is US and China. The real source of friction is Chinese position on Taiwan and South China Sea. China has achieved its economic status and strength due to its economic integration with the West. Otherwise, it was a poor third world country. Is China now ready to risk all this progress and gains for its nationalistic objectives, Professor Sung. Kindly answer that. Please unmute yourself. You are muted. Thank you, Doctor. I could just now I 
replied the discussion in the chat box I said that what you call China's nationalistic objectives are actually to improve Chinese people's living standards. China is a big economy in terms of its economic aggregate, but on average, China is still backward in many aspects. China is not a developed country. China is a developing country. Well, um, I don't I don't agree with the uh, questioners. Uh, remarks that the real source of the fake of the friction is Chinese opposition on Taiwan and South China saying I think the real source is China and the US and some other countries are ideologically different. I think this is the main point not um, Taiwan question or South China say of course they also involves the disputes between China and other countries but the main point is that ideologically China and other countries are different. What I want to say is that China will not risk doing anything to harm other countries. We just want to improve our own living standards. I, I'm just an ordinary person. Uh, I have to say that I'm a person who loves peace. We don't like to conflict with other people, other countries. I don't think that, you know, the question you just asked, I don't think that there would be a war between uh, Chinese mainland and Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sung. The next question is from Dr. Shirikan Chopra, and I will address it to Mr. Nilawar. Uh, the question is, if China resolves the border issue with India, would US-India cooperation slow down and benefit China and dampen US-China decoupling process. Mr. Nilawar. Yeah, yeah. So that is, uh, there are a lot of assumptions in that question, okay? Uh, assumption is that uh, first uh, the border uh, issue will be resolved, okay? Even if it is resolved, uh, China, um, China's position uh, on Taiwan and Senkoku Islands, will it change? It won't change. There are a lot of, uh, China border, Taiwan, and Sankoko Islands are all independent uh, locations, and the policies are independent. So, uh, USA and India's um, uh, relationship will continue and maintain because China is too big, okay? Very big nation in Asia. And uh, this um, uh, China, China's uh, uh, engagement with the USA or USA's engagement in China uh, is a long term uh, going on for the last 40 years. So uh, USA has a lot of leverage inside China, okay, using trade and a lot of these uh, things which are already the US policies are they are working on. So they have leverage, so they need to use that leverage the way they want to do it. So India China border issues, whether even if resolved or not resolved, okay, USA China, USA will use its policies uh, for the benefit of American interest and security in Asia. But India is still needed, no matter what, for the security in the Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific area. And America will partner with India, and it's a key partner, strategic partner to maintain the security in the Indo-Pacific, whether it, the border is resolved or not, okay? So we have to be very careful. The assumptions uh, have to be very careful because Asia is a large uh, area and the economies of Asia and the population is huge. It's going to be very significant. After this G20, we're going to see the world where Asian economy is going to be very big. China, India, population as well as the economies are going to be very big, including with Japan. So security of this area is very critical and India will play a very important role in the Indo-Pacific area. So there is a lot of things going to happen in the last, uh, next 40 years. So that uh, question is premature and a uh, lot of assumptions behind this question. So I gave you the reality, so that should answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Nilawar. I may emphasize that this is a people-to-people -people dialogue arranged by Council for Strategic Affairs, 
one may call it a track two kind of channels of communication to discuss things in a civilized manner. I am highly thankful to Professor David Sung from China, uh, Mr. Dinesh Nilawar from United States, and Mr. Satoru Nagao from Japan. It was a very enlivened uh, conversation and discussion, and we hope these kind of discussions are helpful in toning down emotions and are able to prevent future conflicts as people realize people to people feelings and relationships and not take somewhat jingoistic actions, whether that is across Taiwan Strait or South China Sea or claiming entire of the South China Sea as a private lake. We hope that that does not happen because it's not going to be helpful for anyone. I'm also thankful to Team CSA that organized this and provided back support, especially Mr. Ripudaman Pachauri and Mr. Rajiv Verma, who have been pillars of support and strength for me to organize these kind of discussions. And lastly, I am very, very thankful to our audience who are not only joining up here or also on YouTube, seeing this discussion live streamed. We will be back on September 16th for our distinguished lecture by General Sayyid Atta Hasneen on military diplomacy, international relations, and geopolitics. So till that time, thank you and goodbye. We shall be back. Again, my thanks to all the distinguished panelists. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Andy for your invitation to attend this uh, uh, workshop. I'm so honored to know the different uh, different opinions from uh, experts from Japan and the US. Um, thank you again. And thank you, Dr. Nagawa. You can go and attend the G20 TV. Day. Thank you very much.